Okay, so I believe you've got a for this section on the 14th, the 17th, and the 21st of October. So that's uh, today and Friday. Um, I may be traveling next week, but I don't know yet. Um, I haven't decided on whether I'm going to the conference or not. It's going to depend on how much the methods uh, are at the moment. Um, but what I'm going to be talking about um, is crystal classes and vowel groups. Uh, fractional symmetry and tribal and bit pairs, space group determination. Um, this bit here called reading the international tables. Um, and that's kind of a little bit of a legacy thing because most of the software now has got very good at, uh, very good at telling you uh, what you've got. Uh, but we will do some um, exercises on, on the international tables. Do you know what the international tables are, first of all? Okay. Um, so in crystallography, there's a set of, of uh, four or five different books. They're called international tables. There's A, B, C, D, E, and F. Um, and the, the A, I believe, is a set of tables which define all the space groups. And they tell you, if you've got a molecule, um, how to take that molecule and perform translation and symmetry uh, um, uh, translations on it to make a complete crystal. They tell you all the, the positions of where things are going to be. And that can be important when you're trying to interpret diffraction data and work out what space group you've got. Uh, the other international tables are all uh, collections of uh, very detailed uh, method studies and, and things like that. Uh, and these are all in Bernard Rook's books, chapters 8. Uh, six, 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 6.5, and chapter 5, 5.2. Um, so, and you can stop me at any time, um, ask questions. Um, but what we're going to start off with is talking about symmetry. And it's a very, very simple concept. Um, if you have a set of two dimensional tiles, um, the, what we're talking about is trying to pack these tiles in a regular order. Uh, so to say, it's very simple. Uh, in this particular case here, uh, you've got a set of tiles which can make up a continuous uh, pattern without any gaps in it. And the reason for different point groups and space groups is the ways in which you can form a repeating pattern without any gaps in how that pattern repeats. Um, now this is a useful figure here because it shows a different set of tiles. Uh, you can imagine that as a different set of proteins. Uh, what it essentially says is that if you have different shapes, it's very difficult to pack them in an order row. Okay. Now the crystallographic data that we get is due to the amplification of a repeat unit. And as long as that unit is repeating in a consistent manner and it's identical, you get the constructive interference that forms a diffraction pattern. Uh, what this means is if you don't have a repeat unit in here, you get destructive interference or no constructive interference, and you get poor resolution, you may not even get a crystal form. Um, so essentially what we're doing is talking about making an ordered pattern. So if you were tiling a floor or something like that, we're basically talking about making a very geometrical pattern on the floor. Um, we're going to be talking about lattices, motifs, and unit cell. Um, the lattice is essentially the, the repeating shape. So in the top part here, you've got a square lattice. In this one, one here, you, you have sort of a, it's a rhombic equal lattice there is. And the, the, the lattice is combined with your motif, which is your protein. And together, that unique unit which repeats makes up the unit cell. And then your unit cell, when it's repeated, makes up a crystal. Uh, the crystal is defined by cell edges. Uh, in a two-dimensional case, we can talk about A and B. And the, it has an angle that is gamma. Uh, when we talk about the three-dimensional uh, case, we'll have cell dimensions A, B, and C. 
and then alpha is the angle between B and C. Beta is the angle between um, A and C, and gamma is the angle between A and B. And I'll show you the three-dimensional uh, setting in a second. Um, so this material, I say, is from uh, Ben and Brooks' book. These are the slides from his book. Uh, it's licensed for us to, to use it to be to cheat the teaching. Now, this is an example of a two-dimensional uh, crystal in the primitive group, so the lowest symmetry possible. And what's important about this sample is the crystallization context. So when we think of a crystal, do you know what the, the typical water content of a crystal is? Quite high. Have you heard of the Matthews coefficient? Yeah. OK. Um, there's a, a guy called Brian Matthews that did some work where he essentially got crystals, and he put them in a, an oil gradient or a, a chemical gradient, and he measured the density of the crystals. And from knowing the unit cell parameters, knowing the density of the protein, and knowing the actual physical density of the crystal, he was able to calculate the water content of each crystal. And this number is called the Matthews coefficient. Uh, you'll encounter it later on in the course, I'm sure. Um, but what it says is that crystals typically have between 30% and 70% water. Uh, so when you think of a protein crystal, um, what you should be thinking of is more like jello. You know, it's not like you, you, you couldn't put this on a ring and give it to someone and make them very happy. Um, <laughs> yes. And the reason for, well, the reason, it's not the reason why the water content is so high, but that fact is important because it shows you that the contacts are actually very limited between the protein molecules. So in this particular case here, um, we can take one of these molecules and you can see we've got about three crystal contacts. Uh, so the actual contacts that make up a crystal are small. They're on the order of about 10 for any particular crystal. Uh, so when you're crystallizing something, all you're really trying to do is affect 10 intermolecular uh, actions over there. Uh, so you'll see that in these interactions, it's the same interaction between each protein here, uh, the same interaction here between each protein. Uh, if you had a few different molecules, like an imperfection here, or you know, another kind of protein, or some kind of mutation here, that may not happen, and then you may not get your crystal. Uh, so crystals only have a few contacts. That's why when you get a protein crystal and you, you put a pin on it or something, it will, it will crush, it will just go to mush. It's not, it's not held together very strongly. Uh, that's also a destructive test for protein crystals. So if you have a crystal that you're trying to determine if it's salt or if it's protein, if you actually just crush the crystal and it goes to mush, it was protein. If it sort of clicks, it was salt. So there's a destructive test for, for protein crystals. Um, another thing that, that you need to think about is the unit cell origin. Um, the unit cell is, is repeats. So when I've showed you the, the top example, this one that's sitting here, where you have your molecule that sits within the unit cell. Very equally, you can have a unit cell where the molecule is, is part of the molecules at one corner and the rest of the molecule are at the other corners. Or you can have a unit cell that looks like, like that one there. Uh, the unit cell itself can be chosen in a number of positions. And some of your processing programs, when you define the unit cell, may come out of a position which is not, not one that has the complete molecule in the unit cell. That doesn't really affect things very much, um, but you just need to be aware that the origin can shift, and it's very easy to move the origin to something else. Um, regardless, as it says, on which origin the primitive lattice is placed, the unit cell always contains the same amount of the molecule. So if we have that, that case there where, it, where it's in the first one, um, the amount of molecule that's in the second one is, is very equal. In the third one here, the molecule would also be equal, it's just not, not shown. Here. So you can imagine if I had this lattice here, you can see I've got you know, four parts of the molecule here. I could very easily move that lattice up in, in that orientation 
then that whole molecule would be in elastis, that whole molecule would be in elastis, and that whole molecule would be in elastis. Um, so there's reasons why you might, you might want to shift the origin. Um, I wouldn't worry about this too much yet. Um, it usually comes in uh, when you have a really important molecule and you're trying to solve it and you get all sorts of problems in the data. Um, then, then you have to seriously start working. One question. Yeah. It shows a primitive unit cell or primitive lattice, mm -hmm. or is this one motif or one set of lattice points? Why would you need a complex or non primitive unit cell with more than one? Um, because it makes the data processing easier. Well, well that, that's not, that's not, not um, So if you have a higher symmetry um, and you're measuring the same set of data, it means that some of the data is actually repeated. And that means that you can measure, you can take that piece of data and that piece of data and then use that as two observations and increase the precision of it. Um, so in this particular case, there is, in a three-dimensional case, there would be more symmetry with that. And what it would mean is that one reflection would be uh, equal to another reflection, equal to another reflection, because there's symmetry there. And instead of measuring a set of individual reflections, you'd have the same set of reflections, but four of them may be equivalent. Mm. And then what you can do is you can increase the accuracy of your measurement, because essentially you're getting four observations at the same point. You can reduce the noise, average them out, increase the signal. So symmetry is good. If we get symmetry, we can either collect less data, or we can get, collect data more precisely. To be clear, on this slide there is no symmetry being to think about, right? If symmetry happens when you have multiple proteins in there. Uh, this isn't, this is, uh, no, symmetry happens from the same protein. This is, so, uh, this is the same protein in a crystal. And you can see that there's, in this particular case, um, there's a translation that goes across here. Okay. There's a translation that goes across there. So there is symmetry in there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I'll show you some cases where there's, there's more symmetry there. Uh, but essentially, to collect a complete set of data, you need 180 degrees for the lowest symmetry that's there. And then anything which increases the symmetry inc uh, decreases that amount of data that you need to collect to get a complete picture of the protein. Um, so here's a particular case where we've got two-fold symmetry. Um, and these symbols that I've got here are actually the same as that will be in the international tables. Uh, and what we got in there is um, a rotation of about 180 degrees, so it's twofold. So this protein here is actually rotated 180 degrees, and you've got one set of symmetry in there. Um, it's perpendicular to the paper plane, so it's, so it's, it's, it's sort of like a, a rotation that's mirrored around there, or rotating around there, it's not a mirror side. Um, and this is depicted by this, this symbol here. And by definition, rotations are applied counterclockwise. I don't know why, it just, that's just uh, how they are. Uh, in this particular case, uh, as we start to build this up here, we've got the rotation that's in there, but we also have a translation. So as the crystal is built up, we have a rotation and then a translation. Um, and then if you look at this one here, that translation has created another two-fold rotation. Because if you rotate that round, that diamond actually gives this. Uh, and again, the rotation, in this case it's red, but it's associated with this symbol here. So this one has rotation symmetry in it, a translation as well. So it's a two-fold rotation. Okay, this is uh, this is P2, so it's a primitive crystal with two-fold rotation, uh, and this one has got different origin choices. So you can see that you have a complete unit cell that's in that one there. If you look at this one here, you have a complete unit cell that's in there. Uh, the two unit cells have different origins, but have the same volume. Each P2 unit cell contains two molecules. 
So this is just showing you that you can actually um, change how you choose that unit cell. Uh, the other thing it shows you is that the crystal packing is tight, so this is a real structure. Um, this probably has a low solvent content uh, because there's not much room for water in there. And as the, the thinking says, crystals with low solvent content often diffract very well. Um, that becomes important because the solvent content is determined not only by the protein, but also by how it packs when you crystallize it. So if you have different space groups when you're doing crystallization screening, it is a lot of, it makes a lot of sense to actually try and take those different particular crystals and actually them all and see if you get a space group that has a low water content that may fact quite high resolution. Uh, the other thing about symmetry is that sometimes when you have uh, symmetry present, you may have an active site that's blocked. If you have another form of symmetry or another crystallization condition, that active site may be open. And if you want to study potential ligand binding or things like that, you should obviously choose the one that's open. This is a fourfold rotation. And the fourfold rotation is given this diamond symbol. Uh, if you start thinking of it, the, the, the curve symbol is this for the twofold. The symbol itself actually has a twofold rotation, so that's how you can, can look at it. When you, and these are symbols that we use in the international table. This symbol here actually has a fourfold rotation, so that's actually telling you when you look at the symbol what, what the, the rotation axis is here. So again, we've got zero going anti-clockwise, 90, 180, going 270. And then we can put this into a structure here. And what we're getting now is a, a fourfold rotation here, and then this twofold rotation around there. So we're starting to build up, um, build up the crystal here uh, with the, the fourfold and then the twofold. And this is sort of leading into a discussion of three dimensional ones because we're starting to build the information that we have a primitive cell, we have a fourfold in there, we have a twofold in there, and uh, this starts to build up into the description of this space group. Um, I should say, a pri I'll, I'll, I'll show you what a primitive cell is in a minute and what the difference is between other types of cell. But we'll go to three dimensions to, to discuss that. Um, so the asymmetric unit is, and the unit cell. So the asymmetric unit is the unique part that once it's actually replicated by doing these translations actually generates the crystal or the symmetry of the crystal. Um, the unit cell is the, the description of the cell that the asymmetric unit sits in. Uh, and as this cell, so once you put the symmetry in, you can reconstruct the entire unit cell with the entire crystal structure. Um, so in this particular case, the asymmetric unit, the unique part of it, is one fourth of, of this structure here. And then when you do the fourfold translation, you generate this, this, and this. And if you put these these two-fold symmetry things, you start to generate the rest of it back after that. Uh, so essentially what you're doing is building up the unique part of the, the, the protein, and then by applying the symmetry, you get the information on what's in the crystal. Now, trigonal and hexagonal are special cases. Uh, and the reason for this is that if you had a hexagonal one, and this is your, this is actually the symbol for hexagonals, it's a hexagon. So again, the symbol shows that you have a six-fold symmetry around that. And you'll notice that the symbol for a trigonal one is a diamond. So you have a three-fold symmetry. Again, when you look at these symbols, they're actually defining the symmetry, symmetry around them. But if you look at a hexagon, you can actually make the the trigonal, the threefold symmetry, by just taking three parts of that hexagon. Um, so hexagonal crystals and trigonal crystals uh, can be dealt with in a hexagonal or a trigonal space group. Uh, yeah, it's 
basically, basically what that says. Um, so when you get a, a, a trigger or a hexagonal uh, data set, you need to think about the other possible space group that could be as well. Um, within those space groups, you can have three fold rotations and six fold rotations. Uh, in this particular case, you've got a three fold rotation there. And then when you generate the, the translation along the MB, you get something that starts to, to look as if it's got a six fold rotation. Uh, Get into that in three dimensions where, where the notation will become easier. So there's 17 plane groups, uh, but only five are allowed for asymmetric or chiral motifs. And I'll, I'll, that, that's a protein, and I'll show you why in a minute. Uh, but the space groups that are allowed in, in two dimensions what's called P1, P2, P4, P3, and P6. Um, so the, whether a crystal system or a cell is trigger or hexagonal depends on the internal symmetry, which has a three-fold or six-fold axis. And you can't decide that from the crystal lattice or unit cell parameters alone. That's also true in the three-dimensional case. So this is the two-dimensional case here. Don't worry too much about it, because we're going to get a lot more complex in a second. Uh, but in the two-dimensional case for uh, cases where there is uh, chiral plane groups, uh, only five space or five chiral plane groups exist. Um, now, when we come to proteins, I talked about rotation, I talked about translation. The one thing that's not allowed is mirror. So you can't take a protein and have a crystal that has another one that's mirrored, because what that effectively does is it changes the the uh, the axis of rotation of the uh, uh, alpha helices, or changes the half of this thing, which is is not allowed. Biology doesn't allow that. Um, so most of most of life is right-handed. All of life is right-handed. You don't have left-handed systems, so that's why mirror uh, mirror operations are not allowed in protein crystallography. Um, there is a term called non-crystallographic symmetry, and what this means is that two proteins. Let's have a twofold axis, a twofold non crystallographic axis. Uh, means that the two proteins, although there appears to be a symmetry, the protein molecules themselves might be slightly different. Uh, so, in terms of, of data here, you, you get an indication that you had some symmetry element that was present, but it would be, the data statistics would be a little bit off from what you'd normally see. Uh, I think we cover. Non crystallographic symmetry and twinning and data processing, I think Bob is actually covering that bit. Um, so, this is non crystallographic symmetry. It's a false perception of, of real symmetry. What is it saying that's saying, like, if you look at the loop that's on the right side of the red protein there? Well, this loop is broken here. That when you. Yeah, and if you rotate it onto the, that loop that's up there would, would not be present. So that the this is actually different. So um, do you remember when I said if you have symmetry, then two reflections will be equivalent? But what happens in this in this case is even though we've got what we think is symmetry for most of the reflections, the reflections that have contributions from this part and that part will differ from each other because this part of the structure is, is ill-defined or more flexible than that molecule. And uh, if you actually say, okay, I'm going to treat this as a certain space group where this reflection and this reflection are equal, when you look at those two sets of reflections, you'll find that the, there is a statistical deviation from, from what it thinks is, should be the average, average data. Uh, so you can treat it as this space group, 
but the data will actually be different. I'll show you that there's a signal there which suggests that there's a difference between what you think is symmetry with related reflections and still not. So this just happens that every other crystal in the lattice, one that has a disordered loop, one has an ordered loop, one has a disordered loop. Well, what uh, what I mean, can happen is that one. So your as an example, uh, it may well be that the way it's packed is that one of the active sites is in like a slightly open position, and with the packing, the other thing is closed, and that's the way it's actually packed together. Uh, the molecules are inherently flexible, but not these static structures, and they want to come into the lowest energy conformation. And one may be a little bit closed, one may be a little bit open. So you may get a situation where you have one molecule in the diamond that's actually in an active uh, position and one molecule that's not. And that may be a really small change. Um, and that just may be where, where it stabilizes and crystallizes. So that's where non crystallographic symmetry comes in. It's not common, but it does occur. And within your data processing, there's a lot of statistical analysis that says um, this particular set of data is performing differently from what would be identical reflections. Uh, so there's lots of, of tests that you can do to look at this. Uh, what, it, what it does give is a false indication of symmetry. It, overall, the data says this is symmetrical, but when you look at specific parts of the data, you find that there's differences there. Uh, and some of the software that uh, you use, if you use Phoenix for data processing, I don't know if you've, you've got into data processing or you've started doing that yet, but there's a program in Phoenix called Xtriage, and that's statistical analysis of all the data, and that will identify these cases. Um, so this is it in a little more detail. Uh, So in this particular case, the, the actual symmetry is given by the, the red here. But you also get symmetry elements that occur from, from different colors. Uh, and these are, are false symmetry because these two molecules are not exactly identical, but they're close enough that you get some indication of, of a false symmetry that comes up from it. So this is non-crystallographic symmetry. Uh, on the, the large scale, it looks symmetrical, but when you look at the detail, it's not. Um, so this is translational pseudosymmetry. Um, now, the title here says translational pseudosymmetry manifests itself in the fact that there's an obscure twinning. Uh, and it can be examined by certain Patterson maps. We're not going to go into twinning here, and we're not going to go into Patterson maps. Uh, but again, a lot of this data processing software will identify when you get that. Um, in this particular case here, the, the two molecules are not exactly identical. And the second is created by a combination of a translation and a slight rotation. Um, it's identified by the difference of these ions that's written here that look a little bit different, those positions are uh, a little bit different. And it would look like if you just had this as the asymmetric unit, and this was a repeat, and that was a repeat, and that was a repeat. But the actual asymmetric unit is, is a combination of both of those molecules together. So it's essentially what it's doing is, is there are cases when you get a false symmetry that's given. And you have to look at the data really closely to determine if it, if it is false symmetry or, or real symmetry. And I guess false is pseudo, one of the definitions of it. So mainly this is just a warning that your overall picture of the symmetry um, might be correct, but there are, are things that occur that, that you should look closely at. Um, so this is sort of a summary of some of the things that occur in data collection. Um, one of the things I didn't mention was that dimers are common and often required for function and protein structures. Uh, and this is a table that, that's actually in the book. Uh, the molecular dimer axis can actually coincide with the crystallographic axis. And that's when you get pseudosymmetry. 
Uh, so if you have a diver, um, that can be a, a problem of, of pseudo-symmetry. Uh, and in terms of uh, lattice fundamentals, um, so this actually gets into the three-dimensional ones. But protein crystals belong to one of about 65 space groups. I believe there's 230 odd space groups altogether. And I'm going to go into this. This really should come after what I'm going to show you in a second. Uh, but there are about 230 ways of packing things in three-dimensional space. And if we rule out mirror translation or mirror reflections, then only 65 of them are available to, to proteins. So you only have to, to learn about a, a, a quarter of what's out there. Um, there's lattice unit cells and multiple origin, origins. So a lattice divides the space into regular translation of periodic units. Um, it's got vectors A, B, and C, which define the lattice sides. It's got angles alpha, beta, and gamma. Um, the combination of the lattice with the molecular motif defines the unit cell. Uh, the combination of unit cell with the translational uh, and uh, symmetry elements defines the crystal. Um, any crystallographic symmetry operation must generate an identical copy of the motif. The only operations that do not change the motif and are compatible with the translational symmetry of the periods to the crystal lattice can be used in the assembly of crystals. What this means is that you can't make a, a right-handed system left-handed, and then when you do translate it, you can't pop another protein molecule on top of the system. So those are the those are the uh, I'm going to give you a copy of all these slides as well, so, so if you you'll have these notes. Uh, the asymmetric unit of the unit cell contains all the necessary information to generate the complete unit cell of the crystal structure by applying symmetry operations. And the motif does not have to be constrained within the boundaries of the asymmetric units of the unit cell. Part of it can hang outside, but it will be repeated in both corners. Um, asymmetry of the motif places limitations on its position in the unit cell. Uh, Basically, if you have an asymmetric system, that can't be located on a, a symmetry element uh, because it wouldn't be asymmetric if it was. And you can also have cases where you have non-crystallographic symmetry. Uh, things that appear to be symmetrical but on closer inspection are actually different. Uh, non-crystallographic symmetry can actually be used in refinement processes, uh, but not, not during the initial index. Um, so this is symmetry in three dimensions, and this is what we deal with in life. So we have a unit lattice, which is defined by uh, cell parameters A, B, and C. Uh, and then the, the angles, uh, uh, alpha is the angle between B and C, beta is the angle between A and C, and gamma is the, the other one that ran left out, A and B, I believe. And the way you can look at this is that the alpha is the angle that has nothing to do with A, beta is the angle that has nothing to do with B, and gamma is the angle that has nothing to do with C. So we have a unit lattice, we have a three dimensional motif, when we combine them, that makes the unit cell, and when we pack the unit cell with our symmetry elements, it makes the three dimensional crystal. Uh, And if we go back to, I think this is what I've just said. Um, so crystallographic coordinate systems are right-handed. So you've got your, your A, your B, your C. Uh, as I mentioned, the angle between um, the B and the C axis is alpha. The angle between the A and the C is beta. And then this angle is gamma. Um, these are all nice degrees in this case. They're not necessarily nice degrees. Uh, but when you are defining a crystal system or a unit cell, uh, A, B, and C define the size of it, alpha, beta, and gamma define the angles that we make in the cell.
Now, when you're actually talking about positions within the inner cell, so this is your molecules within the inner cell, the way it's defined is that the lattice points have integer indices located in the inner cell corners. So the, the maximum dimension in this is 1, 0, 0. Now, this is not a reflection coordinate, this is not HKL. This is just how you define a coordinates in the inner cell. In this axis, the C axis, that point is 0, 0, 1. In the B axis, that's 0, 1, 0. Uh, and when you have positions where you're talking about where your molecules are in the inner cell, it will be fractions of these coordinates. And then to get the real coordinates, these are all multiplied by the inner cell uh, dimensions, uh, which gets a little more complex when you have non, when you have angles that are non nice degrees. And I'll show you the equation for that in a bit. Uh, again, it's just enough to know that the equation exists. You don't have to memorize it or anything like that. But some software will talk about positions in this notation. Some software will talk about positions in uh, this notation multiplied by the unit cell parameters. Uh, so it just, it just depends on how the software is using it. And I think the, the, the coordinates are uh, the definition here is, is talking about what I, what I mentioned here. So, lattice points have integer indices and are located at the, the unit cell coordinates. And it's very easy to translate from this maximum indice into the actual position. Uh, but sometimes it does involve some trigger on, trigonometry if, if you have non match degree uh, angles. Alpha, beta, and gamma are non match degrees. Um, so these are the different possible um, lattice types you can have in protein crystallography. Um, there's six primitive lattices. We have triclinic. A triclinic is the simplest one. It has very little symmetry. And in triclinic, the lengths of A, B, and C are not equal. And the angles, alpha, beta, and gamma, are not equal to 90 degrees. Um, there is monoclinic. And in monoclinic, again, A, B, and C are not necessarily equal. Um, alpha is equal to gamma is equal to 90 degrees. And beta is not 90 degrees. Beta can be any number. Uh, well, it, A is not equal to B and not equal to C, but all the angles are 90 degrees. So this is um, uh, essentially a three dimensional rectangle. Um, Trignal, also hexagonal. So if you remember, the, the trigonal space group can also be represented by a hexagon. Uh, a is equal to B, C can be any value. Alpha and beta are equal to 90 degrees, and gamma is equal to 120. Uh, tetragonal, A is equal to B, alpha equals beta equal to gamma, 90 degrees. And then finally, cubic, uh, which as this name suggests is a cube. A is equal to B is equal to C. Alpha is equal to B is equal to gamma, which are all equal to 90 degrees. So each one of these dimensions is the same. Each one of these angles is 90 degrees. So each face is a square. Um, so these are the six fundamental lattice types. They're the only ones you'll come across. Uh, and I've talked about, in the next slide is basic translation. Um, yeah, just the point that the internal symmetry can be lower or higher in six case than the overall lattice symmetry. Um, but I've talked about primitive, like primitive lattices. Um, when you've got those lattices, so those are the primitive shapes, um, you can also have situations where you have face centered or body centered. And what this means is that. Um, each one of those lattice points can be considered a point where that, that molecule could be, could be centered. Uh, we'll also have cases at the top there where you have a body centered one to try not with either, where you have a, a repeating unit that's actually centered within the center of the lattice, or it could be on the face, where on the monoclinic where you've got one on the face. So in this particular case, you've got body centered, I. Uh, face centered, <coughs> face here, or this centering here, which is which is down at the bottom, 
Again, in the cubic case, you've got body centered or face centered. And in the trigonal case, you've got a nerd kind of situation where you can have this kind of thing. Um, so these letters, I, F, and C, are going to come up when we talk about space groups. P is primitive. I is for uh, uh, body centered. F is for face centered. And C is for the, the opposite face. Situation there. And this is a special case, trigonal, this, this R that's used here. Um, I'll show you the space groups in a minute. Um, there are some translational centering here. Uh, in this particular case, this, this has been moved by a half, a half, a half. In this particular case, this has been moved by a half, a half, a zero. And uh, I'll show you what that, that means. Just a um, so does that make, a sen make sense that there's, there's six primitive shapes that you can have? And then within those shapes, you can get centering on the face or internally with it, or in this special case like that. So this is going to lead into the, the definition of space groups now. Um, but before we do, Um, I'm not going to go into this into too much detail. Um, just suffice it to say that if you have a rhombohedral space group or you have a hexagonal system, there are there are more difficulties associated with it. Um, if your if your indexing comes up as R3 or H32, uh, that's when you will really need to go and cry. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, I, I won't go into that. It, it, it's in the book, but it's, it's not fun. Um, so this is a little bit about uh, the getting onto the, the mirror um, symmetry and why it's why it's not possible. Uh, inversion is another kind of uh, mirror operation, but this is just to basically say that the inversion is not allowed in. in in symmetry elements, because it changes something from something that's biologically correct into something that's biologically not. Um, now, I talked about uh, rotation, and I talked about translation. Um, that was in two dimensions. When we move to three dimensions, we get another kind of system here. And you'll notice the, how the motif is shown here. This is actually a screw axis. And what it means is that this is rotated, but then it's also translated. Uh, and this is a three-dimensional thing where you, you basically can now do a symmetry element that actually has three dimensions of motion. Uh, they, depending on the, so we've got these, these symbols here. So screw axes are n fold rotation axis plus a one over n translation. So uh, a two, it's a two-fold rotation axis plus uh, one over, plus a one over n translation, so a half translation. Uh, three-fold, uh, three, two, four, one, four, two, four, three, six, one, six, two, six, three, six, four, six, five. Uh, these all tell you uh, uh, the, the rotation axis, so a three-fold one would have Three positions, four fold will have four positions, a six fold one will have six positions, and then the, the number that comes after it would tell you that within the six fold screw axis it's one six, two six, three six. So it's actually going in, and uh, that six fold one almost looks like a little spiral that goes in. So these notations are going to come into the space groups in just a minute. Um, what's this one? I think I just showed you that one. Uh, these are very common in, in proteins. In fact, the most common one is, is P212121. I'll get to all that bit in a minute. What's the notation, the, the subscript? 
Um, so what the sunscreen means is that, that for a two-fold one, you essentially you're rotating it 180 degrees. Right. And the subscript is just telling you that, that you've got a rotation, but you've also moved in by half a unit cell, one over two, one over there. Half a unit cell. Yeah. Okay. So, for example, three one would be a three-fold rotation, but with each one of those rotations, you move in by one third, by one third. And three two would be a three-fold rotation, but each one is also moving in the, the, the C direction by two-thirds and two-thirds. So gotcha. it's just telling you it's, it's a way of representing a three-dimensional space with a, a one-dimensional number. Okay. Um, so in fact, this is just another way of saying it, it, it exactly what I'm saying. Um, what we're doing here is we, we're looking down this one here, and this one, I believe, is a threefold, so it's a three-one. So basically, you see how you've got a threefold rotation of the red, the blue, and the green? So the threefold rotation is in this dimension. And then if we were to look down that axis, we've got a one-third, one-third, one-third translation. So it's uh, this would be 3, 1. So it's rotated. So there's, there's three symmetry elements in there, so it's 120 degrees. And then a 1 over 3 translation in, in that dimension. So that's what that, that is essentially, essentially showing you. This is why you always look at things in three dimensions, because when you look down that dimension, it looks like they're overlapping, but if you were to rotate it, they're clearly separate. <sighs> now, three two is a two third rotation. Uh, so, again, in this case, we've got the three fold 120 degrees, but what it's showing you is that we've got a two-third translation of the symmetry elements, and then we also, it, it's also possible to put some other elements in there, so you have this, this build-up of these other molecules. So if you imagine that unit cell, it can be overlaid, so it fits there. Uh, So switching from 3, 1 to 3, 2 changes the handiness. Um, and then we'll, we'll go into substructure handedness for, for the fading part. So is 3, 1 and 3, 2 the same thing? It's just how you how, how you decide your handedness? Uh, it's not really the same thing, but you, 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 have, you have sort of another set of units that can fit in that space. So, so there is a handedness change there. So this, this, the ones that fit in here have, you notice there's a different hand from that to that. I'll, I'll come back to that. Uh, now, the math is actually fairly straightforward for this, you know, it looks pretty complex. But it's possible by a rotation and a translation matrix to work out the positions for any element that's in there. Um, and I won't go into this in too much detail, but I will have a question that will come up on this later on. And I will refer you to the, the, the book to actually work it out. But if you have a position, you have your rotation elements, your positional elements, and your translational elements. What you can do is get the new position, very simple, simply from, from this matrix here. Uh, and this applies for uh, non um, for non nice degrees as well. So, and these all these values, these numbers, and these translational elements. When I talked about that book called the International Tables. 
this information is going to be available within the international tables for all of the space groups. So essentially what you can do is take a position, work out where the new position is by plugging these numbers in the values you have and put them out of those positions. Um, so and just to point out that's the vector notation and this is the explicit mathematical notation. Um, there's only a limited combination of symmetry operations um, because if you have two things that clash, that's not possible. Um, and then there's another vector notation that is, but you will never have to worry about this because that's all taken care of in software. It's just knowing that, that it's actually there. Um, what this means, though, is that you can combine up to three independent symmetry operators with a Bravis transla translation. And the Bravis translation, what I haven't said, is the lattice is called the Bravis lattice. It's the guy that actually first described them. And the number of possible space groups is 230 general space groups. But if you are applying strict chirality, or you don't want to, to, to change the the right-handedness, the left-handedness, only 65 of them are actually allowed. So in protein crystallography, you only have 65 space groups. Um, and what I'm going to do is actually stop with with this this slide here. We're going to finish early today because I have another meeting. Um, and then I'm going to come back to this in the next one on Friday. But these are the 65 different space groups that you have. Uh, these are the lattice properties, and if you remember, we defined those those uh, earlier. So you've got triclinic, monoclinic, orthorhombic, tetragonal, trigonal, hexagonal, and cubic. Um, the Bravis lattice. So if you remember, I said there was uh, primitive, there was face centered, there was body centered, uh, and then there was the, the the bottom part of the face. So those are the Bravis type, P for primitive, um, I for body centered, F for face centered, C for centering on the, the opposite side. Um, and this is actually the number, the, this is the number that refers to the Bravis lattice. This is the type, um, so primitive, primitive, primitive. And then these are the chiral space groups. So P1 is a primitive cell with a one-fold uh, translation. P2 is a primitive cell with a two-fold uh, two rotation. Sorry. Uh, P21 is a primitive cell where there's a two-fold rotation, but then there's a screw axis that takes it in, one, one half of the unit cell. Uh, C2 is a, a two-fold rotation, but you've got the uh, position that's also on the bottom part of that, that space group. Uh, P222 means that you have a primitive cell, it has a two-fold rotation in one dimension, a two-fold rotation in another dimension, and a two-fold dimension in the rotation in another dimension. And then you get to something like uh, this one here, P43212. This is that one there. This is from my design. That one means that in the it's a primitive lattice. In the A dimension, you have a four-fold rotation. That's one, two, three, four. But it's a four-three, so that means that uh, if I've got a set of molecules that are if I've got a four-fold rotation like that. P43 means that that one is one third in, sorry, uh, that one is, is on the board. That one is one third of the unit cell into there. That one is two thirds of the unit cell. That one is three thirds of the unit cell. That's what P, P43 means, is that you've got a, a screw axis with a four fold rotation. Uh, P4321, 21 is another dimension, so that means that that is. Uh, there's a two-fold rotation in that direction. So this one here, 
is also sitting there. Um, and it's in one half, so that goes in in a half. And then G4, G2, 1, 2, 1 means that in the other dimension, so I've done two dimensions here, in the other dimension there's a, a rotation axis. So I want you to think about these, and then on Friday we'll come back and we'll actually discuss individual space groups and try and describe them in three dimensions and see if you can wrap your heads around them for that. But I'm going to stop here because I have another, another meeting I've got to run to. So uh, we'll probably go on a little longer on Friday and go through more about the uh, 65 space groups. Just quickly, what is the, what is the point group? represent the numbers listed there? Well, the point group is just a, it's um, it's a number notation for, for the description of the symmetry. the symmetry and the crystal system. So, and I can so get it. Two I can, fold uh, and yeah, I'll get into that. Gotcha. Yep.